Business Connections. This is a program produced by the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce where we keep you up to date on issues that affect the businesses in the Dayton area. I'm Holly Allen, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. Well, if you've been paying attention to the news going on at the state level of legislation, you know that there's a lot going on, a lot to discuss, particularly topics that are affecting businesses in our area, and that's our topic for today. So joining us to discuss that is Ohio Senator Bill Beagle and Director of Public Policy and Economic Development for the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce, Chris Kirshner. So I want to thank you both for glad being be with us today. We Thanks are glad Holly. to have you here. We want to jump right in because, Senator Beagle, yeah. you just finished a big job, the Governor's State Operating Budget. Yeah. It's a big undertaking mm -hmm. every two years. That's correct. So tell us, when you go into an operating budget, what is your approach to tackling all of the issues encompassed in that budget? Sure. Well, as you said, we do a budget every two years. We're spending in excess of $70 billion over the course of those two years. So as a member of the Finance Committee, I sit on the Ways and Means Committee, which looks at the tax aspects of the budget. There's a couple things we do. We do break it up into pieces so that it's assigned out to various committees. So as members of several committees, I, I especially focus in on certain areas like tax, workforce development, and some other areas. And every member of the Senate gets to contribute in, in some way by serving on a committee that's going to look closely at it. So every bit of the budget is going to get examined in great detail by at least a committee. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, defense that's played because our budget goes beyond just spending dollars. There's a lot of policy questions in there. Uh, education policy, how do we evaluate our teachers, for example, or, or any number of things that could be uh, relevant to, to all of us. And so, you know, not only am I advocating for uh, the changes I want and the priorities that I want, I'm also watching what other people are doing because sometimes they propose something that may impact us. And so you've got to play defense, for lack of a better word, and kind of see what other people are doing. So you, um, it's a time of, of high vigilance. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at everything and, uh, and be prepared to put in a lot of hours. Because things are getting slipped in, so you want to make sure that you catch everything. They are. An example would be the Ohio Historic Preservation Tax Credit, which you know, in the Senate, um, uh, an amendment was put in that basically eliminated that over the next couple of years, uh, pending a, a study to see how it was done, which nobody really expected and nobody anticipated. It's a program that really hasn't created a lot of um, um, questions. And so a lot of us were caught, a lot of proponents like me were caught off guard by that. And so all of a sudden, you're, you know, my phone starts ringing off the hook with advocates here locally uh, and the people in Dayton who are looking to buy buildings and need these tax credits to make these um, projects financially feasible and all of a sudden the idea of them going away is going to impact Dayton because mm -hmm. these buildings that are for sale or in the process of being sold are going to stop and they're going to stay vacant. So you get to work and, uh, and so yes, you, um, you're, you're watching every little thing and uh, when your phone goes off it's, there, there could be something coming that you really never expected and all of a sudden, like all of us, our day gets blown up a little bit mm -hmm. and, uh, and we find ourselves fighting for something that you really didn't anticipate having to fight for. It's interesting insight into how that all works every two years. Well, it, it is. Uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on, uh, on Medicaid, uh, mm -hmm. education, and uh, incarceration, uh, prisons. Those are our three top items that we spend money on uh, across the state. And, and uh, this is no exception. We, we have a lot of uh, changes in our tax policy this year, um, more changes in, uh, in education funding and higher education funding, and, um, and certainly some work with prisons as well. So as, as I mentioned, you know, of course, as, as the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce, a lot of those issues we take great interest in, those oh, sure. affecting business, education, mm -hmm. um, and, and livability right. in the Dayton area. I think one of the, the big uh, topics that came out of the budget this year was the project going on at the Montgomery County sure. Fairgrounds, which is, is sort of in the downtown area. This is the, um, it's called the Midtown Development. Right. $2.5 million for funding for that project. Miller Valentine mm -hmm. is behind the project and it includes housing, office buildings, retail space, and what we've all been waiting for, especially those living downtown, mm -hmm. a grocery store, right, right. something we've been hoping for. So what can you tell us about, how, how, about this funding, how it came about, and is it unusual for the government to back such a project? Um, I don't know about un unusual, but it doesn't happen all the time either. So the amendment came about from, uh, from Representative Jeff Rezebeck uh, here in the Miami Valley, and, and it's something that, you know, it could easily be considered a capital budget project as well, and you talked about an operating budget. And so a capital budget is something we do on alternating years. 
So, but, but there's different ways to look at this project. Um, you know, it, this, I think the, the, the state's interest in this project involves economic development and the redevelopment of the downtown area and an investment in, uh, in an urban core, as opposed to, you know, a new fairgrounds. Um, it, you know, uh, the state has many, many fairgrounds, and, and so, you know, we have different avenues to help fairground funding. Um, this is more an investment in, in a redevelopment area and an economic development area, and it's a jobs program. And so that's really what caught the state's interest in it. And it has strong local support, and that's important. Uh, the state doesn't necessarily want to step in and be the sole funder of something or the majority funder. And this is actually a small portion of the entire project costs. Um, it is because we have an interest as a state mm -hmm. in trying to bring jobs to the area and improve quality of life and to spur redevelopment and take an area of town that's vital. Uh, it is a gateway to the southern part mm -hmm. of the city. And hopefully it will do what we um, hope in that it will spur some redevelopment in some of the neighboring areas. It will bring residents downtown and, uh, and allow our businesses uh, extra opportunity to enjoy places to shop, places to stay, places to eat. And it will work well. And the state has an interest in that. So it is a little unusual. It's unusual, if nothing else, that with 132 legislators, there's a lot of us who are looking for dollars this time of year for projects that are fairly localized. So we have literally a thousand amendments uh, to the budget, some of which are asking for dollars for various projects. And so it's always a difficult time to sit through and figure out where do you devote these precious resources and who's going to get told no and who gets told yes. And it's, and it's a challenge. So, you know, for somebody like me who puts in 40 amendments and maybe you get four or five or six. So it's, that's not a bad, it's like baseball. If you can get, um, <laughs> if you can get, you know, a quarter of what you ask for, that's a pretty good day. It's a right. pretty good day. And, uh, and Representative Rezovac and his leadership and, uh, and with uh, cooperation from the Senate to leave it in there, we were able, and the governor for that matter, we were able to get some important dollars here that I think will get us a lot closer to seeing this project come to fruition. And it'll be transformative for, uh, for Dayton. You talk about interests of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, those interests sound very similar, Chris, to what the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce interests would be, and that would be um, the quality of life and the economic uh, development and the, the growth that might be spurred from this project. Can you talk about what this might mean for businesses in the Dayton area to really strengthen the core? Yeah, absolutely, Holly. Thanks for bringing that up. And just to, to go back on a couple issues that, that Bill's brought up, uh, you know, I was one of those folks that was calling Bill with about the Ohio Historic <laughs> Tax Credit. And to have the senator that was right there willing to answer those calls and willing to go to fight for something that was so important to this region, we really can't thank him enough. Uh, we have a tremendous advocate in Senator, Senator Bill Beagle, and we just truly appreciate having him on our team to fight for some of these critical projects for the greater Dayton region, uh, for the northern part of the area, but also for Dayton. He really is there for us, and we really appreciate all the great work he's been doing. Absolutely. Um, and then the fairgrounds project. So the fairgrounds project, uh, you know, Senator Beagle is exactly right. This is more of a downtown redevelopment project more than anything. This is about taking uh, an opportunity, a, a piece of uh, property that's in, the, in right outside the core of downtown, and redeveloping it. Redeveloping it so that it is more applicable to modern uses. Use the better use, uh, use that land a little more strategically uh, so that we can help grow some of the businesses in this area, provide opportunities to new businesses, and provide services to residents and employees that work in that downtown, greater downtown region. Uh, so that midtown area is really seeing a lot of growth lately. We had GE Aviation move in with a few hundred jobs uh, mm -hmm. down there. Emerson Climate Technologies is building their new office right there. You have Universal One Credit Union there. You have Cox Ohio uh, Media Group there. A lot of investments have been made in that area. We're seeing a lot of redevelopment. And that next step to link that area to downtown is really this midtown redevelopment project. Uh, and if we can provide more residential opportunities for downtown living, we can provide more services for downtown living through uh, grocery stores, maybe uh, unique niche um, uh, uh, professional services mm -hmm. for downtown livers, uh, as well as uh, some entertainment options. You know, they're considering things like movie theaters and other things like that that mm -hmm. could really be a nice venue for folks 
in the downtown area, but also provide some support services for some area businesses. So this is really an economic development tool. It's a, uh, it's a way to attract new businesses to this area, but also support businesses that are already here and already existing. And we're a lot closer to having this, this project finalized now that we had the support of the Ohio General Assembly and the state operating budget. Definitely drawing a lot of interest from all yes, sorts of different absolutely. people in town. Um, did we talk about funding, some of the funding that came from the budget. Um, one of those issues, which I'm sure you two shared phone calls about, was the uh, Third Frontier Internship Program. $2.8 million. Um, it was fun it's to fund the program for two more years. Mm -hmm. There was some conversation about ending that program. It was to end in June. Um, it's very important to our members in the chamber, and, and they voice their concern about the ending of this program. So I'll start with you, Chris, because of, of our interests here. Can you tell us about what the program is and why it was so important to our members to keep it around? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Holly. We have been uh, administering the Third Frontier Internship Program since it began, and I think it was 2002 when the program first started. The Dayton Chamber has been the West Central Ohio partner with Development Services Agency uh, for the Third Frontier Internship Program. Through this program, the Chamber gets about $421,000 uh, a year. Now, don't, don't misinterpret that. We don't get $421,000 <laughs> no, a year. we do not. We are the recipient of $421,000 a year, that, and we are then the entity that takes all that money and redistributes it out to the business community uh, through the Third Frontier Internship Program. Uh, we distribute that out to for-profit companies that meet the requirements to be part of the Third Frontier Internship Program not just chamber members, it can be any business uh, in the West Central Ohio region. Uh, we work with chamber members and non-chamber members on the program, really any of eligible business uh, that comes to us and has an intern that meets the appropriate criteria, and that criteria is they have to be in a high demand field, uh, and there's a giant list of high demand fields that Development Services has. Uh, then they're eligible to receive a stipend for 50% of that intern's wages, up to $3,000. So businesses can uh, can have up to 10 interns that are part of the program each year. Mm -hmm. uh, so a business can get up to $30,000 to help support their internship program. Now that doesn't pay for all their all the costs associated with the intern, but it does help supplement it. And it helps incentivize that business to look towards some of our local college interns for workforce opportunities. If a business is considering whether they wanna hire somebody who's not an intern or somebody is an intern, this is just a little incentive that helps them look to creating that workforce pipeline that's important to all of us to help and help bring some of our, our talented folks uh, at our local colleges and universities right into our local business community. So we've been administering that program since 2002, and we were notified uh, this past winter that it was going to end at the end of June 2015. So that immediately uh, got a lot of our members' attention. So we had a lot of businesses uh, that were concerned about that, and they were contacting us, uh, and that then activated our lobbying and advocacy arm at the chamber. Uh, our members sent a little over 2,000 letters to uh, state legislators. Wow. Senator Beagle's mm -hmm. and Senator Beagle's mm -hmm. office was probably a recipient of some of those letters. Um, <laughs> Your mailbox was full for a while. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, they were advocating for the program to continue and looking for some help and some innovative ways for the program to continue. Uh, and one of the great champions of that was Senator Beagle. Uh, he was one of the first ones to call back and say, how can I help? This looks like it's a critical program in the business community. Uh, and we, uh, we then engaged with him and we were able to take it from there. So uh, I'll be happy to let Senator Beagle talk about it because that's where we, we yes. kind of connected right. and then he, yes. he took the reins and went from there. So Senator, we appreciate your support. Yeah of that and uh, yeah, tell, tell us, us tell us how the process it. well it, it, it this ties in nicely with our conversation on the budget because mm -hmm. what we did or what I did is created an amendment to the budget one of these thousand amendments that we talk about uh, one of them had to do with uh, you know having the development services agency continue this program mm -hmm. and so we we crafted an amendment to do just that and uh, and provide the funding and we were able to get it into the Senate version and then convince our friends in the house to uh, to keep it and then uh, the governor didn't veto it, so that's that's always um, a, a legislative accomplishment. You know, I've certainly been on the business end where you get things through both chambers of the house, you get it in front of the governor, and then he vetoes it, mm. and you kind of uh, forget that he's got that authority there at the end. But we were able to get this into the into the budget that we were just talking about, and you know. I do, uh, I chair the Senate's subcommittee on workforce and economic development, and really internships touch on both of those elements. 
you know, you have to, as you know, as, as members of the business community, you know, every business seems to be struggling to, to find the right worker. Mm -hmm. And so in workforce development, we're trying to make sure that as an economic development tool here in Ohio, that we have the best workforce possible. The other problem we're solving with internships is this idea of students, you know, leaving Ohio for better opportunities upon graduation. So by having a vibrant internship program, you've got employers who can tap talent, as, as Chris said, and take employees on kind of a test drive. Employees are these students who get some real world experience. They get a little bit of, uh, of pay and, and compensation and some experience in the real world. And, you know, oftentimes these can lead to full-time jobs. And so it can prevent or, you know, by giving students uh, opportunities post-graduation to stay here in Ohio, you know, the economy still is, isn't great. And so the, the idea of having a job right here and a company I know and people I know is, is very desirable for students. And, and likewise, the employers can benefit because, you know what, Richard's worked for us for however long. We know he's a great employee. And you get, uh, it's just a, a win for everybody. And, and I think the state does have an interest in making these decisions cost effective for employers. And by helping out a little bit and demonstrating our commitment to that, we're helping our employers solve some workforce issues. We're helping our students find meaningful work experiences, and we're helping some of them find uh, careers right here in Ohio. Right, because you know, usually once they they get settled in the area, that mm -hmm. that obviously gives us a better chance to keep them in Ohio, so we're not losing them to other states. So. And I think you're right. We have, I think we all agree, that this is Ohio is a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to put down roots. Um, you know, we we don't have the mountains, we don't have the beaches that that some have. But if we can get people here, we can often get them to stay here. Getting them here to begin with is is an issue. But we have great universities here in Ohio, and so we do attract a lot of uh, talent from outside the area. It's a matter of keeping them here, and a good internship program uh, is part of that solution. Well, we're very thankful for your work that ended up uh, right. getting two more years of the Third Frontier Internship Program. Chris, were you going to say something? Yeah, was, well, I was just going to say, we actually have some data uh, from the Third Frontier Internship Program that shows that about 64% of the students that participated in that program stayed here in the Dayton region for wow. full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. that's and that's number. exactly what the program is meant to do. Take, I mean, you're not going to be able to keep every every intern, and that's understandable. You know, some folks like to get back to their home states where their families are, or maybe get a job offer out of state. And mm -hmm. as much as we'd like to keep them here, as much as I'd like to give every single one of them a job offer, sometimes it's just not possible. Right. Right. Uh, but have 64 percent of them that are able to stay here, we consider that a real win. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the internship program, we've had over 200 companies participate, and over 600 interns oh. that have gone through the program. So when you think about 64%, that's uh, you know about 700, about 650. I'm sorry, 350. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. About 350. I was counting on you to do that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm a lobbyist, not a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> 350 uh, students that found full-time work in, in the state that probably wouldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. So. That, that's a real win uh, that's helping our business community it and helping our students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you, Senator Beagle, for, uh, for him championing this initiative, for it staying in the budget, uh, for the General Assembly passing it, and for the governor signing into law. So this has really been a strong partnership. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We want to move on from, uh, from the education side of things. We want to talk about another positive outcome. And again, this is business related, obviously. 6.3% mm -hmm. um, cut in income tax sure, sure. that came out of the budget. <clears throat> now, obviously, this means um, big news for mm -hmm. our businesses as right. well. Can you talk about that? Sure. It's, it's one of the centerpieces of the budget, really. You know, coming from local government, you know, why a decision, why a company makes a decision to, to locate in Ohio or maybe stay in Ohio or grow in Ohio, it's complicated. And each company has different priorities. Cost of business is certainly one of them. And so at the state, you know, one of the things we can do to impact a cost of uh, doing business in Ohio is looking at our tax rates. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, uh, since the Kasich administration has been around, uh, and this budget is no exception, we've endeavored to try and, you know, reduce that cost of doing business. And in this budget, we were able to succeed in, uh, in continuing some small business tax cuts uh, at 75 percent um, tax cut for uh, small businesses with incomes a quarter million dollars or less. And then in 2017, they're going to face no tax liability. So for your first wow. quarter million dollars of income will be tax-free. And we know that over half of Ohioans work for companies that, that fall under this measure. So, you know, it is, again, it's an economic development strategy. It is a low cost of doing business strategy. 
so that we can you know, try and retain the companies we've got uh, as well as attract others. And so along with our, our local you know, government partners, our county partners can, can make every, you know, our friends at Jobs Ohio, you know, you, you all come together as a team and, and pitch in where you can to make the best proposal each and every time. And you can't win them all. Mm -hmm. But certainly we're doing our part to try and reduce the cost of state taxes, uh, looking at reducing regulation. And, uh, and this budget, I think, goes a long way towards helping uh, individuals, working class families will pay, will get to keep more of their paycheck. Uh, our business owners will have more money in their pockets to perhaps buy that extra machine or hire that extra person. Um, and that's all going to work out well for all of Ohio. Absolutely. Chris, can you, can you comment a little bit on how it will affect our member businesses? Yeah, a absolutely. Uh, and Senator Beagle's exactly right. It, it's a lot easier and more economical to keep a business and help a business grow here in Ohio mm -hmm. uh, than to lose that business and have to attract another one to the state. Now, don't get me wrong, we still want to attract as many businesses here as we can. I think that's <laughs> probably something we all agree on. Yes. Uh, but it is a lot easier and better for everybody in the game if we can help grow some of those companies that are here. And by providing a positive tax climate, businesses now have more money in their pocket that they can invest in their organizations. They can expand their facilities, they can hire more staff, they can, uh, they can do uh, operational uh, uh, advancements that they've needed to do. It provides the business owner with that flexibility to make the decisions that they need to make to be able to operate their business and grow right here in Ohio. Ultimately, it creates a better business environment for businesses in Ohio, which is a good thing for all of us. It's good for the chamber. Mm -hmm. It's good for Senator Beagle. Right. Mm -hmm. It's good for those interns that need jobs. It's really a win-win-win situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We mm -hmm. want to attract as many businesses as we can to Absolutely. the area. Like you said, I think everyone can agree on that one. Exactly. Um, while, you while we have you here, sure. Senator Beagle, uh, we talked about, about the budget, but we do want to not ignore an issue that's going on right mm -hmm. now in the state of Ohio. It's a, it's a large issue and um, is still kind of in limbo at the time of this right. taping right now. Okay. Um, but the work continues um, on the marijuana issue. Oh, sure. it's, it's ramping up mm -hmm. um, and we think headed to the ballot. Again, this is all subject to right. the timing <clears throat> here. Um, but you could, can you talk about the process at least mm -hmm. and, and where we're headed, how this works and what it looks like from your perspective? Sure. Well, we have a, you know, Ohio voters potentially could be confronted with a number of things going on in November that's going to require, um, you know, some information, some homework and some decision making on their part. You know, th there could be a decision about, you know, legalizing marijuana in Ohio. I would urge people to get educated about it because what the proposal calls for is basically creating a legal monopoly and uh, or an oligopoly. We got several people who are you know wealthy individuals and businesses who are able to through the Constitution um, guarantee themselves a a, a business. Mm -hmm. Which as a business person, I would love the opportunity to somehow <laughs> yeah. you know get rid of my competitors and, and set things in stone. And and so you know what's in front of the voters goes far beyond just legalizing marijuana. They need to get educated because really we're creating a monopoly. And, and you know, in the Senate and in the Ohio House, I think we're in agreement that you know, we really want this to end. And we don't want people of means to be able to buy their way into the Ohio Constitution and you know, wall off competition for whatever business interests they have. Mm -hmm. So voters will see an opportunity to um, pass a, a constitutional amendment which will prohibit this type of activity in the future. You know, the future will tell whether or not they're going to be voting on this plan to create this marijuana monopoly or not. Mm -hmm. um, but you're going to have at least, you know, at least one question, and that's going to be, do you want to change the Constitution to, in the future, prohibit this type of activity so that our Constitution isn't for sale? Um, the, you know, it does not prohibit the legalization of marijuana down the road um, or through some other means uh, or medical marijuana, but it will, um, it will, you know, I think force people to, um, to, to go through a different process so that we can have a more genuine conversation about the issue. Chris, from the business point of view, again, as we wait mm -hmm. and see where this sure. goes, can you give us some insight? from the chamber and from our members and what they're watching with this issue. Absolutely, yeah, this is, a, this is an issue that's garnered the interest of a lot of our chamber members. Mm -hmm. And regardless of their personal feelings on the legalization of recreational and medical marijuana in the state of Ohio, they've had two real serious concerns that they've been voicing to the chamber. 
One is exactly what Senator Beagle is talking about, the fact that they don't like that this is putting a monopoly into the state constitution. The state constitution is an authorizing document. It authorizes general governance for the state. It should not be listing exact business owners and business locations in the state constitution. Uh, you know, it should create a general process and allow for fair market competition, mm -hmm. uh, but not ha actually name that in the constitution because then if any of that wants to be changed, uh, it has to go back to a vote of the people. If the tax rates want to be changed, if, if mm -hmm. folks in Ohio really uh, want marijuana and that's what they choose to, to, to authorize, but they want to change the tax rates down the road, they have to go back to the constitution to change. It can't change with the economic needs and demands of the state. How, uh, you know, Senator Beagle just went through the budgeting process and they're able to adjust tax rates down because the economy is doing well in the state and they were able to reduce the income tax by 6.3% that wouldn't be able to happen on this because it would be locked into the Constitution. Uh, so really it was that general uh, philosophical view that this is just bad government to be putting this into a Constitution. We've also heard some concerns from our members on the negative business impacts that legalizing marijuana could have in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And again, even some of these folks that were calling me said personally, not a big deal to me, but professionally as a business owner, this is going to kill me. And here's why. You, uh, once you legalize marijuana, you're creating greater access to an intoxicating substance. And I think we would all agree that when there's greater access, there's greater usage. Uh, and a lot of those business owners are saying, I don't want impairment on the job. I need to have strong employee productivity. I need to have strong employee reliability. I don't want the legal challenges that could come with this if I try to prevent that usage in my office. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm going to have employees that are challenging it. I'm going to be challenging employees that I, that I uh, suspect are using. And it's really going to result in a lot of legal liabilities and risk that as an employer in the state of Ohio, we really don't want to have. So there's some serious concerns around the operations, uh, the operations for businesses around the legalization of marijuana, mm -hmm. increased uh, increased drug screening cost, right. uh, you know, like I said, workforce issues, uh, business climate perception, uh, are all issues that are safe, new increased safety risk, right. are are all issues that have business owners looking at this very seriously uh, with a concerning eye. With yeah, a concerning absolutely. Eye. We'll be seeing more on this. I'm, yeah. I'm yes, sure this will. isn't going away. We're yes, just a few will. months away, and mm -hmm. so this will can definitely ramp up so voters should be keeping an eye and keeping educated, as sure. you said, Senator Beagle. I want to thank you both for being with us today. Yeah. We appreciate Thanks the insight me. into the budget and, and the marijuana issue, and um, we appreciate you taking the time sure. to be with us. Glad to be thank here. you for watching, and if you want more information on these issues or the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce, just go to DaytonChamber.org, and you can keep updated again on especially the marijuana issue as this ramps up uh, follow us on facebook twitter linkedin and you can see more of these videos on our youtube channel thanks so much for being with us have a great day now that the state's biennium budget has been signed by governor Kasich, today's program was a great opportunity to discuss those areas that affect us the most as both individuals and as businesses the Big 8 Ohio Metro Chambers and our partner, the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, had some legitimate misgivings when the first draft of the 2015-2017 budget was rolled out back in February. The emphasis seemed to tax some more so we could relieve other taxes. But that caused too many competitive win-lose outcomes, so we all shared in the cost of a professional review by CPA and consulting firm Ernst & Young that helped us better understand Ohio's needs and the current political climate. This vetting was shared with the governor's office and both the Senate and state representatives' leadership. We believe our elected leaders use this and other input to develop a much better pro-business budget for the next two years. We very much appreciate our elected leaders' abilities to weigh other perspectives on issues like these as they work to prioritize our resources and govern our state. Today's Business Connection program allowed us to discuss a number of the key issues that the business community felt was important to improving our business climate in Ohio. We hope you have found this program informative and will continue to view this programming at every opportunity. Thank you.